So for many people, the idea of quality of care is defined by what goes on in the doctor's office, or at most, what happens in the physical four walls of a hospital. But what's of even so is that at the point they're beginning to focus on quality, a lot may have happened. You know, there might be a medical emergency or a crisis, and maybe they might have been exposed, you know, to irreversible harm. But quality, like we've been hearing since the conference started, is about equity in healthcare. It's about safety, timeliness, effectiveness, efficiency, and for me, most importantly, it is about patient-centeredness. So these are the six dimensions of quality as identified by the Institute of Medicine in their landmark report, Crossing the Quality Chasm. In our society, it is common to hear people benchmark quality with size of a health facility or how beautiful the health facility is. But my answer to them, whenever they tell me that, you know, when people are looking for facilities to use, as somebody who works in HM, and I tell them, I said, if that was the case, why are developed countries still interested in quality improvement? Because you have massive hospitals, you have some that are as big as skyscrapers. Then secondly, I commonly hear people, what I refer to as a record is there syndrome. I want to use this hospital because my record is there. My father has been using it. That's where my wife gave birth. That is where we go when we're sick. So you have one facility, one doctor, treating everything from what they understand and the one they do not understand, and we think is okay. It's because patients are not carried along when they're being treated. So somehow, they are so dependent on the facilities. They don't even realize that their health record is their personal property. It belongs to them. It does not belong to a hospital. So this is what we see. But let me even pause for a while and ask you, you know, for the people in this room, how many of us have had experiences, you know, with our loved ones or friends that we felt that some medical error may have occurred or we weren't really, you know, happy about the um, health out outcome, the medical outcome. How many people here? Please raise up your hand. And these are people who actually have a certain level of understanding in healthcare. So we can imagine what is going on out there with unsuspecting patients. I had a personal experience in 2017 when my son during inter-house sports fell and I broke a leg and I was called by the school to come pick him up because he, he basically could not get up. So I drove to the school, picked, them, picked him up that night and we got into Lagos like about 10 o'clock and I headed straight, of course, as I was going there, I was calling my colleagues to find me somewhere where I can see an orthopedic uh, doctor. So I headed straight to the hospital. And I got there and there was no doctor there. I, I only met two staff. And I asked where the doctor was. They said, the doctor is coming. I waited there about almost an hour, about 40 minutes. Nothing was done. I was just sitting there with my child. When the doctor came, finally, oh, there was an interesting part. Before I could, um, the doctor <laughs> came. They had prepared a room for, for us. And they told me that we could go into the room. I never even disclosed I'm a doctor whenever I go to hospitals because I want to have the same, I want to have an experience. So he said they prepared the room for me. I said it was okay, but I, nobody has seen us. So how do we know we're going for admission? So anyway, the doctor came, splint in place, um, they stabilized my, my son, and he actually told us what the problem was, and that we're going to have a surgery, and it was better that this surgery is done within 48 hours to ensure that there are no complications. So 
I agreed. And I asked the question. I said, okay, so where is the surgery going to be done? He said, here. I said, okay, can I see the theater? He said, oh, the theater is locked. I said, okay, so who is in your surgical team? So he said, well, they have nurses that are coming. I said, yes, but if you've been operating here, at least you should have some information about the surgical team. So we, I couldn't get that too. Long story short, I took my, my son home. I engaged him. We had agreed that maybe we'll go to another facility. I was also calling the teaching hospitals to see if I, you know, if we had to do the surgery there, if we could get a bed space. You know the reality in this country. So, after all, he couldn't provide me with the information I needed. So I, I started making calls. To the extent that I called my colleagues outside this country, is that not ridiculous? I had to call them to find out where we could do this. This is a simple surgery. It wasn't even something very, you know, it wasn't a crisis. So later I got um, introduced to a doctor who apparently is Nenugu. I called him, asked the same questions, and you'll be surprised. I'd really like to show you what transpired. I asked him for his theater. I hadn't seen him physically. He sent this, this by WhatsApp. I asked him all the other questions. These are my text messages with him. So I'd really like you to pay attention to the last bit where he said, I am happy you have asked all these questions, as few parents do. Are you medical or PhD? Because he answered all my questions. He knew it was right. He knew that the outcome for, uh, that patient-centeredness is one of the considerations for quality and good health um, outcome. So long story short, my son is well, thank God. He's carrying on with his sporting activities. But I am the founder and CEO of a HMO called Novo Health Africa, and I do get involved with cases like this, sometimes worse, on a daily basis. As a HMO, we are involved at different phases along the continuum of care while attending to our enrollees, and we constantly have to deal with issues, whether at the local provider level or at an organizational wide level, or a full-blown systemic issue, consequent of the inefficiencies of our health system. So issues of quality can occur at any step in the entire patient's journey. Looking at my own experience, and also from an industry experience, but through the lens of those six dimensions of quality. One, which is information. It is central to patient-centeredness. A patient-centered approach to care requires that patients are carried along and are active participants in their care. But each day what happens? We come across doctors who do not want to be questioned about patient care. So patients, even the most basic things such as name of the attending physicians, they'll just tell you, oh, I saw a doctor. Come on, doctor. The doctor doesn't have a name. So doctor, you have a patient sitting in front of you, you don't even introduce yourself. That is, that, is, that is wrong. That is so wrong. So this is a mail that we got from one of our patients because we now introduced what we call the power of the patient. We took it up trying to enlighten patients because we decided that maybe if we push quality from the patient perspective, we would get results. So we launched that initiative, Power of the Patient, and we encourage our, the enrollees to be talking to us. So this particular gentleman wrote to us, and one of the things he mentioned there was how they would shout on them, how staff, he actually mentioned the hospital, but of course for confidentiality, I had to block all of them. So he mentioned that this hospital was shouting on them and wouldn't even listen when they tried to ask questions. Medical personnel in general need to conquer this professional pride. I know, you know, it goes with the territory. I'm a doctor, you know, demigod. Nobody can ask me anything. Just take what I, what I give you. Let's embrace this evolution in healthcare history and begin to treat patients' inquiries not as an impediment to care, but as an opportunity to enhance care. Even in the HMO industry, we have to quit ambiguity. That is for us. 
not even the providers, as HMO, as plans, most of our enrollees don't even understand the plan that they have, which is where the issues even start. We do not explain enough on the plan. Clients of a health plan should be able to explain their plans in their own words, including when at the hospital, the treatment that they are going to get. So it's important that whatever plan you are in HMO, you should be able to look at that plan and in your own words, in the way you understand it, be able to uh, explain it. Do we have a long way to go in patient-centeredness? Clearly, I'll say yes from where I see it. But that is not to say that it cannot be achieved. I mean, if I sampled across this room, I bet some of you don't even know your health insurance plan cover. So let me not ask. Many people are carrying it, but they don't even know what it covers. Mm. I see Chikwe already shaking his head. You know, we only scramble for a few information when at the, we're at the point of access. It's when you get into that hospital. You begin to say, oh, am I covered for this? Call my HMO. You're wasting time. But unfortunately, the information you get at that point, it's probably not well understood enough to support your ability to participate and take decisions on your own health. The entire health ecosystem, however, must be prepped with the patient at the pinnacle of it all. Healthcare needs to learn from other service industries and encourage customer participation. There are customers because no industry can improve on quality without customer participation. Let's also look at timeliness. Think of this surgery. I had 48 hours to have that surgery. But in the first 24 hours, I spent it looking for even where to have the surgery. I want a plug and, and play health system. I don't know about anyone else, but at the time I had the issue, I would have appreciated if there was, you know, something that could take care of that gap that I had. But unfortunately, permanent disabilities and sometimes even death have occurred due to harmful non-instrumental delays. There have been cases where patients are held down in hospitals instead of referring them to the right facility where they can get immediate care or at times just outright extension of admission so that bed spaces are occupied and paid for, not minding that the patient is at the risk of contacting other hospital infections or developing further complication. Let's look at safety. Safety in itself means not harming people when you give care, it's that simple. Is the care you're going to give, is it safe? What is the, common, the most common diagnosis you've ever heard? Can I ask the um, audience? Malaria and typhoid. That is it, malaria and typhoid. And this is really a serious issue. And patients do not understand that safety issues can occur in outpatient care and also inpatient care. They think it's only when you are in the hospital. Malaria and typhoid. Safety issues could be as a result of wrong diagnosis, poor treatment or wrong prescriptions. So these are medical errors. In Nigeria, many people leave the hospital without knowing anything about the pre their prescribed drugs. Giving patients the wrong prescription ranks highest and is most common cause of medical error. Our doctors are human beings. They can make mistakes, so we need to you know, pay real attention. Ask, let's get up from the comfort of not have, you know, having to think, but we want the doctor to think for us. Uh, this is really interesting. This is something that occurred between us and a, a hospital. Where you look at the date, you see 15 April. Let me just go back to that time, Nina. It's good that you see this. It was 15 April that they made um, this request for a pint of blood. Meanwhile, if you look here, on 29 March, when the patient came in, we had actually asked them to refer the patient to a tertiary institution because we felt that they could not manage it. Okay. Fast forward, 17 April, almost a month after. <laughs> this is what the hospital now wrote. I'm finally telling us, well, this is because at that point, it was, thank you for your mail. It was well received. Based on, anyway, gave us some least, uh, reasons 
why they would now want to refer the patient a month after. You want to refer the patient because the case had gotten complicated. It that became, in short, that woman fought for her life. Then on safety, safety and timeliness, somehow in our industry we'll find it linked. Because most of the time when we're looking at the request of a provider, we're checking safety issues. And sometimes we waste time. You know, a lot of processes. So it will also be good if HMOs can cut down on their processes. Here, we had a request. Said somebody came into the hospital and complained of cough and kata, and a diagnosis for chest infection was made. So I don't know what, are, you know? So you try to get this, these are the things, this is real. These are the things that we see that causes issue. So let's look at the efficiency, which is to avoid waste. Don't duplicate tests and procedures. But in our country, what we see is that if you went to 10 health facilities in a week, you will repeat the exact uh, tests and procedures that you did 10 times. You will do it 10 times. We have diagnostic sensors, and yet we cannot trust them. So how do we want our health system to function? What are the tiers and what are the responsibilities of each tier of care? Every clinic you see now runs its own diagnostic and lab that meanwhile, sort of good outcomes, efficiency is gradually fading. This also simply adds, adds to the cost of care. And the workforce also suffers because, of course, when you're spending money furnishing all the other things, the workforce, they're not being trained. And the, the, the hospital or the organization also loses, you know, the ideas and creativities on how to do things better, if they have streamlined and mastered one. So it's a case of jack of all trades. This is the efficiency. Somebody came and treated, uh, was treated with malaria in July. It was barely two weeks, went back, and they're treating the person of the same thing. For effectiveness, another huge problem where you always have HMOs and providers, you know, argue a lot. March your care with scientifically proven methods. A provider will tell you, from my experience, when did medical treatment become optional? When did it become based on provider's you know, uh, uh, um, decision? Without you know, basing it, we all went to school. If not, we shouldn't have gone to medical school. We are being taught their treatment protocols, their, you know, their grounds for making certain diagnoses. But people want clinical uh, experience over the years more than scientifically proven. So do not give patients drugs that are not needed. Here, somebody has a respiratory tract infection. This is a request for us to give cough syrup. But guess what? Ten, ten units of it. Ten bottles. Is this not, is this not a serious quality issue? And so many people are addicted to codeine and we're wondering where it's coming from. We want to just stick to what science has tested and proven. Personally, I think that this is the bane of our problem. If we can do something about this, then we would have improved a great deal on quality. On many instances, Nigerians are asked to discontinue their prescriptions even when they leave this country. There are many people who have been treated here then you know, they travel, see another doctor, they are asked to discontinue. But we should be able to challenge it here in this country. I have seen practices reject WHO guidelines and in some cases claim that there are no existing standard treatments. I don't know if anybody federal, from Federal Ministry of Health is here because you guys have a lot of work to do. They said that there's no standard treatment, we have argued this, and some claim that it's so obsolete. If there is a change in treatment protocol, we need to see the documentation. We cannot claim on behalf of 190 million Nigerians for something not scientifically proven. Health insurance models under managed care is, is more of a population approach to healthcare, and we focus more on outcomes. So a HMO will pay a provider according to the right treatments and reject bills not in line with delivery delivering outcomes. 
during NHIS meetings, have begged that they look at this issue of quality. Because sometimes when you hear HMO is owing, HMO is owing, it's not really because HMOs don't want to pay. Yes, sometimes you owe. Every business has, you know, creditors and debtors at every time in your life cycle. People are owing. Yes, you will owe. But you and the provider could actually manage that. But most important is that some of those uh, claims are not genuine. And if we do not talk about the quality, I don't think that NHIS will ever get it correct. Because providers bank on the fact that NHIS will do this to you, will suspend you, will do all that. And that is cheap blackmail. We need to transparently, you know, have this talk with both HMOs and providers. I am not saying that owing providers is right. But if that was the case, I believe that they can always, you know, find a way around it. But the main issue is claims not paid because of quality issues. On a daily basis, we encounter that. So equity, this addresses fairness. It is on record that not up to 20% of Nigerians have access to healthcare, despite the rollout of NHIS. People are still refused treatment unless a cash deposit is made at uh, the point of care. Let me fast forward this a bit. So having talked about all the challenges from my personal and industry experience, what are we going to do about it? So to run a successful system, I believe that the HMOs and, and providers must partner. We need to educate patients. Health literacy is very important. It's important that everybody understand and be able to interpret their, their health treatment in their own words. Public-private partnership, government, we can have audit firms, audit both HMOs and providers to ensure that they're delivering on quality. There's also room for private-private uh, partnership. We're happy with digital health. The, now, there are some apps that will allow both HMOs and providers to actually you know, streamline and make sure that they, they um, follow the treatment protocols. Then consumers, you should know about your health care, I've said it. Then as a community, finally, we now need to start paying tithes to hospitals, please. For people that pay tithes to, to churches. I'm talking about philanthropy in healthcare. We need to pay serious attention to it. You have um, hospitals being funded by foundations or giving things. People are, give, those hospitals that you like to go to abroad, somehow that's how they, they, you know, they, they keep them. How many times have people been treated in a hospital and we now go back? and give them, you know, support their, their efforts so that more people can be treated. Whether it's public hospital, whether it's private hospital, go and thank the hospitals. It will give, you know, it will help other people. Having said this, a lot of crazy health indices, uh, tomorrow we'll be talking about maternal, maternal mortality, we know that we're doing very badly in it, but the only way we can change all these health indices, if we start acting and not just talking about quality improvements. Thank you.